Hello, I'm Joseph. Thank you for joining us again for this week uh, to listen to God's word again. I would like to ask you to close your eyes with me again and we'll ask God to bless us before we start reading God's word. Please close your eyes. Almighty God in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day you have given to us. Whenever we may be switching on to watch and listen and pay attention to you, Lord, we pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to speak to our souls and may the power of your word, Father, accomplish wonders in our lives and transform our lives. Forgive us and be in our midst is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You see, we live in a world that is so confusing, so confusing that people wonder whether God exists. You see, the existence of God is questionable. There are many people who say God doesn't exist, but many of us do discover the blessing of knowing that he exists. It's almost like for me, when I consider or compare these two opinions or worldviews, one that says that God exists, the other one that says that God doesn't exist, it seems to me that two individuals are sitting on a hill, looking at the ocean and they're asking, can you see the high? And someone says, yes, of course I can see. The other one says, no, I can't see. All I can see is the ocean in front of me. And they kept on arguing. The one that is saying, I can't see the high, says, well, there's an ocean in front. How do you know the eye actually exists? And the guy sitting on the other side says, the very one that you are using to see is the high itself. Because you're using the high to see the ocean, you can't prove whether the high exists or not. It's almost like that in this conflicting situation that we are going through, when hundreds and billions, if, if not, are refusing to accept the existence of God, some of us say, no, God does exist. Because it is illogical for us to come to the conclusion that out in this cosmos or cosmic or this universe, big massive explosion took place and out of the explosion came a very well-ordered, well-constructed, well-run universe. It's very difficult to believe that, yet many people choose to believe that. But for me and many others, do not accept that fact because God does exist. So today's sermon title is called How God Beyond Description. You see, the point is this. When we describe God, then God has to be existing at a level or in a realm where our human ability to observe can observe God. That means like, for instance, if I make a description of the building, I can see the size of the building, how high, how white, the color of the building, and my eyes, my eyes are able to create that image into my brain, and I can process that and describe that building. Whereas the existence of God, you cannot sort of lock God into a conceivable size like a building or a rock or a star or any, anything that you can imagine, any material thing that you can imagine. Because God himself declares that he exists beyond the realms of our comprehension. That is why the title of the sermon simply is How God Beyond Our Description. So the thing is this, as Christians, as Christians, we cannot even begin to ask the question, God, does he exist or does he not exist? We can't even question how big God is, how short God is, how long God is, because the moment we ask those questions, it is blasphemous and it belittles the greatness of God because God is so massive that we are incapable. Questions like who is God or what is God, these questions undermines the existence of God. And therefore, we cannot have the ability. I was sitting and thinking through this question and I've been writing out some things and I want to run uh, past you uh, on the PowerPoint for you. This is one thing I wrote. He is too great for our brain to contain him. If we could explain him, how our brain has become bigger than the sum of him. What I'm simply saying is that if you can conceptualize God himself, if you can say that God is like a mountain or God is like a river or God is like a ocean, 
then your brain is able to conceptualize God. That means the sum of God, the entirety of God, whatever constitutes God, your brain is able to conceptualize. And all I'm saying is that if you can reduce God to that kind of conceivable matter and reduce it in your, in your brain and say that you can understand him, then God has refused or ceased to become God and our brain has become greater than God himself. So the thing here is this, is that our ability to describe him is beyond, we cannot describe him, he's beyond description. We cannot even start to ask a question about him. So great is God that we can't even begin to question whether he exists or not. And this is something I wrote, a reality all encompassing that our brain is lost in its shadows. So in other words, the greatness of God is so big that our brain can't see, our hikes can't see. We are just under that infinite shadow. And because we are in that infinite shadow, our brain ceases to conceptualize the greatness of God. And that greatness of God is as real as the nose on your face or eyes on your face. You see, he is indescribable. He is incomprehensible. He is invisible, he is complex, he is mysterious, he is incomparable. And again, this one, he is terrifying, he is frightening, he is powerful, he is indestructible, he is incorruptible. And look at this one again. Nothing outlasts him, not even space and time. He is greater than the sum of the universe, yet smaller than the atoms, he feels everything everywhere. Those were some of the ideas that came to my mind as I was trying to think about this challenge that modern human beings go through today. When people are saying, prove to me whether God exists. Well, I'm from PNG. Those questions did not bother me. But when I came here to Australia and working among, among Australians, very civilized people, the question of God's existence becomes a constant question. People will say they don't believe in God because you can't prove it. You can't prove it because God cannot be contained in any material space. So the universe that we know consists of space, time, and matter. These are the three things that consist the universe. God himself cannot be contained in space. God cannot be contained in time. God cannot be contained in matter. And because of that, God is beyond human ability to prove its existence or realize that he exists or ability to even conceptualize that he exists. That's why when people say, well, God doesn't exist because there is no evidence, in a way they are telling the truth because evidence, you find it in space, in time and in matter. If God is beyond space, time, and matter, how can you find evidence of a God who is beyond space, time, and matter? So look at this statement that I, that I wrote here. It says, he is confronting. That is, God's existence is confronting. I just wrote it up. He is confronting, overwhelming. We cannot run away from him. We cannot hide from him. He is altogether lovely, he is rich in mercy, all forgiving, slow to anger, quick to forgive and love. One thing is sure, this God, you can reason him out and say that he doesn't exist. This God, you can feel him out and say, I feel he doesn't exist. This God, you can't say, I can't see him, so therefore he doesn't exist. This God is beyond matter, beyond space, beyond time, and the reality of God will always confront us. So if that reality will always confront us, we can't get rid of him, we'll have to deal with him. We'll have to deal with him. And the good thing is this, this God is our comfort in sorrow, our healing in sickness, strength in weakness, friend in toils and trials, comrade in the battle of life, 
And you know what? Our Father truly indeed. That is the God we have. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, this sweet, gentle, powerful, real God, people want to swap it for other things. Well, this God, they cannot destroy him or get rid of him. He is our King, our Lord, Mecca, Savior, our everlasting Father, now and forever. Then look at this one. He is not a subject matter to be studied and discovered. He is someone to know and live with. See, that's the point. God cannot be studied like a theme or a subject. God is not an item to be analyzed. God is a being who has got personality, a personality who chooses not to tie himself with space, matter, and time. And it is the exercise of our own free will to decide to choose that God and worship him. If that God was not real, many people would not fall in love with him and follow him. Many hundreds, if not billions of people, have actually died believing and falling in love with this God. There are innumerable evidences that proves that this inconceivable God exists and he is a real power and a force, a real loving personality to be reckoned with. So, ladies and gentlemen, and my brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this. When we are te- dealing with this God of the universe, for those who do not know God, they live as though it doesn't matter. But those of us who know this God, we live as though everything matters because He is real. See, when we believe in this God, traditionally, as worshippers of this great God, we always use Him when we are in need. That means when you're sick, you go to Him. When you are angry, you go to Him. When you're stressed up and when things don't go wrong, you call the name of Jesus Christ or God. But this God is not there only to provide solution, although it does provide solution to all the challenges and the questions we ask. But this God has personalities just like any one of us. He has emotions just like any one of us. He wants to be connected just like any one of us. He wants to relate to you and me just like any one of us. Life is not sweet if you are not connected with someone, if you are not related with someone. As I said last week, no man is an island. That is very true. We cannot live all alone somewhere in the universe. We are meant to live with each other. We are relational creatures. And relational creatures creatures find themselves feeding on the relationship that they have with others and continue their existence as human beings. Likewise, the God who created us is also a relational God, and therefore he also craves for a relationship, longs for a relationship. This is the mysterious thing about this God we are worshiping. This God is so mysterious that this powerful God can reduce himself and become so quiet that people walk over him, talk over him, His name has become a swear word. They insult and curse in his name, and yet this God has become so patient and he still watches and hopes and longs and waits for us to come back to him. So you see, when I wrote this statement, he is not a subject matter to be studied or discovered. He is someone to know and live with. That is really true. We don't go to God to become some artist, the heart of knowing God, or become a professor or professional in knowing God. No, when we come to God, we come to God to be acquainted with him 
and intimately connected to it. So God has made some provisions to help us get ourselves related to him. God has created ways through which we can become acquainted and be related to him. You see, God cannot be discovered through our own strength. That means we cannot use our brain, use our own senses to find God or discover God. God can never be discovered using your five senses. God reveals himself. If God was part of matter, if God was is somewhere in space, if God was part of time, then our highest, our years or the five senses will come into play to look for that God. But because he exists beyond those three components that makes up the universe, God has revealed himself. He has to reveal himself so we can discover him, find him, and get connected with him. So when he reveals himself, we have to look at his revelation, and we have to believe his revelation, and accept his revelation as evidence of his existence. We cannot create our own on basis of observation, like the scientific world out there, they have laws that they follow. They have processes, well-tested processes in place to test ideas and theories, to prove ideas and theories so that ideas and theories can materialize and become tangible, become something that we could use it or we could avoid it. Whereas, in discovering God, we don't use human ideas to discover God. That's why in the Bible, in the book of Corinthians, God himself said, I don't have the text there for you, but the Bible says that man's wisdom is God's foolishness. That means when, when God reveals himself, men may not necessarily accept that revelation. How are wisdom... God sees as foolishness. So that means when God reveals himself, he reveals so we can see the, on, on his terms and preferences. Over here, there's a book I was reading, um, and, and in this book, this is what it says. Christ was God essentially, and in the highest sense, he was with God from all eternity. God overall blessed forevermore. The Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of, Son of God, existed from eternity, a distinct person, yet one with the Father. He was the surpassing glory of heaven. He was the commander of the heavenly intelligence, and the adorning homage of the angels was received by him as his right. So this quotation is really interesting because this quotation tells us that God send someone who was very close to him as the ambassador of his existence, to tell the universe and the world that he exists, to reveal himself, he sent someone we call Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago he came, born as a helpless baby, grew up and lived 33 and a half years, and he was killed and crucified. And the story is, he resurrected and he went to heaven. You see, the interesting thing, though, about this story is that although Jesus historically did exist, Jesus historically did exist, but there is some kind of a mythological part, there's some kind of a story that you could not scientifically prove it. That is, Jesus, although it is a historical story, Yet there is another side of the story linked to that historical figure, and that is the story of his resurrection. See, this is the struggle people are facing today. On one hand, they have a Jesus who actually lived. On another hand, that Jesus who actually lived is linked to, according to their version, a myth. That means the story of resurrection is a myth attached to a real being. But the problem is that 
if you look at all the other myths that exist in the world, mythologies and religions and things like that, you will find that all those myths are never linked to real people who lived. So Jesus Christ, the one who said that, that I am the Son of God, the one who said that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life, the one who physically and literally existed in this world and then physically expressed that his existence, his material existence, his material crucifixion is linked to this immaterial resurrection that took place or this immaterial existence that God is existing in. And these two ideas, many people have a hard time trying to marry them. But as Christians, we know that as long as Jesus did exist in this world, the purpose for which he exists in, the, in this world 2,000 years ago is to die for us and save us from our sins. Now, why am I sharing you all these things? Why am I sharing you with all these things? The reason why I'm sharing you these things is because when we are living in this trying world, you want to end your life on someone other than human beings. Now, at this point in time, as I'm talking, COVID-19 is sweeping across the globe. Hundreds and thousands have died. And right now, as I'm speaking in Papua New Guinea, it is spreading, I'm told, like wildfire up there. And one of our members of the parliament has died as a result of COVID. And it is saddening. The fear of this disease is not like if I'm sick, I will go and see a doctor because the doctor is supposed to know the solution to this problem. What is so frightening for me as an individual is that even doctors have conflicting views about this disease. There are some doctors who have other views, and others have different views. And even this drug that they're creating now, there are conflicting views as well. And so it's so conflicting that it creates anxiety, uncertainty for the future, and completely at lost and very frightening. And when we are going through difficult times like that, it is better to rely on a God who does not exist in space, time, and matter. God who is able to exist out there and who has the capacity, the ability, and the power and penetrate right into our space and time and matter and manipulate the laws of nature and cause miracle and do wonders in our midst. You see, the definition of miracle is defying the laws of logic, defying the laws of nature. And God who lives outside of space, time, and matter can defy the laws of logic and laws of nature and do wonders that no human being on earth can do. So the message is very simple today. The message simply is this, to trust in that God that no one can see with their own eyes, no one can feel with their own hands, no one can smell with their own nose, is real, and yet we cannot have used the five senses to realize he exists. It's better to trust in that God. In the book of Revelation, there's a particular verse here I want to read. It's not on the screen. There's a text that I want to read. In, that is in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. This is what it says. Um, if you have your Bible, you can open to that. Revelation chapter 19, and this is what it, the text says. It's, it's one of my favorite texts. It says, And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. That verse. 
right there in the book of Revelation, it describes this big crisis, bloodshed and, and all kinds of things happening in the book of Revelation. And what comes here is that right in the midst as this most assuring hymn written. The hymn goes something like this, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto our Lord. So that means in spite of COVID-19, in spite of political crisis, in spite of our loss of lives, in spite of the fears that women go through, the verse says that salvation belongs to God, honor belongs to God, and power belongs to God. And it is wise to trust a God who has power. God who is not part of matter, part of space, and part of time. Every problem that we are dealing with exists in space, in material world, and time. God lives outside there, and therefore he is able to put his powerful end through the space of time and matter and space, and he can manipulate and create wonders and heal us. It is better to trust in God than trust politicians, trust scientists, trust doctors. It is better to trust that God in this time of trial. May the Lord bless you. Let me pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful thought that comes to us. Help us to have our confidence and trust in you. Without you, we cannot do anything. With you, we can do everything. Lord, as the world is going through tough times, we want to place our lives in your hand, that our life can revolve around you and through you, that with you and by you, may we go through the challenges and not just to be relieved of the problems we're facing in this world, but one day when you come to take your people, may we be found with you in your home, is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.